I was fascinated by the sights I saw there. Unsophisticated teenager, just turned 18. Battleships all over the place with big guns sticking up. I was at a cruisers and submarines and over in this other place where I was supposed to be were the PBYs. Well, they called us to muster on the steps of the administration building. And the bosun made Canadot four or five at a time, marched them off. And there was one man left standing. And he says, you must be Messner. Yes, sir. He says, well, kid, he says, uh, the squadron's all full up. My goodness, I says, what about me? He says, well, somebody will flunk out. You'll, we'll get a chance to pull you up. In the meantime, we're going to put you on temporary duty aboard the, the Avocet. I said, what's that? He says, that's a seaplane tender. I says, where is it? He says, well, it's out to sea right now. You'll be coming in tomorrow. I kind of figured uh, I was let down. I was betrayed. I wanted to be on one of them big fighting ships or an airplane battleships with the big guns sticking up all over them. I said, here, and they put me on a tugboat. But I was mistaken. The Everset turned out to be a very brave ship. When the battleships eventually were sitting on the bottom, burning and exploding and capsizing, they called upon the Everset to go alongside and put the fires out. They were like dinosaurs trapped in the tar pits. And the Avocet went amongst them while the bombs and torpedoes were slamming into them. And we poured water on them. We pulled people out of the water. We did all kinds of things. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. At 6 a.m. Hawaiian time on December 7, 1941, the first Japanese attack wave launched from a point 275 miles northeast of Pearl Harbor. The first wave of the strike force consisted of 49 high-level bombers, 40 torpedo bombers, and 51 dive bombers escorted by 51 fighters. As these flew southwards, they split up into different sections, each with its particular objective. At 7.02 a.m., an hour after they had taken off from their carrier decks, two Army operators at the Opana radar station on Oahu's north shore picked up the approaching Japanese fighters on radar. Although U.S. Army enlisted personnel manning an experimental radar system spotted the incoming aircraft, the duty officer at Air Defense Headquarters dismissed the bogey, suggesting that it was a flight of B-17s due from the mainland. About the same time, a destroyer, the Ward, exercising outside the harbor entrance, spotted a submarine periscope and made a vigorous attack. The Ward had killed one of five midget subs trying to break into the harbor. No one took the destroyer skipper's frantic messages seriously. The first Japanese bomb was dropped at 7.55 a.m. on Wheeler Field, eight miles from Pearl Harbor. That morning at 7.55, my friend and I, Steve Seabag, were going to attend church services. As we're approaching the church, we heard a hum of uh, planes behind us. We looked back and over Mountain Pass, which is known as the Coley Coley Pass, we saw planes coming over. As we looked back, we noticed that there was a rising sun on the wingtips. So when I saw that, my Legs uh, locked. I got a chill through my body, and I thought to myself, forget about ever going home. But anyway, as they came overhead, they came so low that you can see their ugly, silly grins on their faces looking down on us. 
As they made a couple of turns, they went towards the quadrangles. There was different quadrangles, the third engineers, the 19th, the 27th, the 35th, each one, each regiment had their own quadrangles. As they went over the quadrangles, we can hear a scraping going on. And as they went over the third engineer quadrangle, they dropped a bomb on the building, and we understand at the time that uh, two soldiers were killed. When they were finished strafing around Schofield, they went on their way to Wheeler Field. From there, we can hear the explosions, smoke bellowing up into the uh, sky, and Major Hart felt sad knowing that these people were being killed, not knowing what's happening to them. And, and you just had a stunner and uh, and just have tears coming out of you. At the same time, uh, our weapons were locked in racks and they were in the weapons room and we were unable to get to them and the weapons sergeant was nowhere to be found so there was nothing we could do. But in the meantime, we noticed that the, after the bombing and strafing stopped at Wheeler Field, we noticed that the planes were going further out which went, meant that they went to Hickam Field and to uh, Pearl Harbor to do more havoc out that way. As the planes reached Pearl, the American crews were on the decks of their ships for morning colors and the playing of the Star Spangled Banner. The Japanese planes moved with stunning precision to their primary targets. The seven battleships moored at Battleship Row along the southeast shore of Ford Island. The first torpedoes hit Oklahoma with a crump and a boom, and the battleship shuddered like a wounded beast. The next torpedo struck almost immediately after the first. Within 20 minutes of the first attack, the big ship began to roll over. She kept rolling until her superstructure hit the mud about 25 feet underneath. I can say there were a lot of targets up there, and uh, the foreigners and trainers were straining the gun manually, trying to get on these targets, and the gun captain was calling the side angles, deflections, and the fuse settings. And um, there were several planes shot down, but there was so much concentrated fire over the harbor after they realized what was going on that you couldn't tell who was getting what planes or nothing. There was just a black barrage up where these shells exploding. But uh, unfortunately, the fuses weren't set on a lot of those shells, and they ended up in Honolulu. And they thought the Japanese were bombing Honolulu, but they didn't drop a bomb in Honolulu. That was our own five-inch shells that they didn't, they had a 45-second time fuse on them. And um, normally, uh, the gun directors would give you the sight angles and deflections and the fuse settings, but our gun directors were off the ship. They were over in the yards for being overhauled. So this was all done manually. and. Um, I don't know, we may have fired some that didn't have the fuse set on them in the excitement and everything, but uh, we had three fuse pots on the, on, the, on the side of the gun and the shells were supposed to be put in the fuse pot and cranked in and that would set the, start setting the fuses on there and it would change constantly as the plane was coming in when we had our gun directors. But, um, Like I say, we had to do everything manually. Standing at a window of the Ford Island Command Center, Lieutenant Commander Logan Ramsey grasped the situation at once. Racing to the center's radio room, he ordered an alert to be broadcast in plain English. Air Raid Pearl Harbor. This is not a drill. Forward of the overturned Oklahoma, the California was punctured by two torpedoes. Oil spewed from her sides like blood. But her guns opened fire and kept firing throughout the raid as the California settled into the mud.
Aft of the Oklahoma, the West Virginia began to sink with her decks afire, her guns also keeping up the barrage. One of the garbage lighters swung alongside to help fight her fires. Finally, the harbor waters put out the flames, but she also sank into the mud. Approximately 10 minutes into the attack, came the most thunderous explosion as a bomb smashed through the two armored decks of the USS Arizona and ignited its powder magazine. The big battle wagon seemed almost to lurch out of the water. The concussion was felt for hundreds of yards around her. The resulting explosion ripped open the hull of the ship and started a fire that swarmed over the ship, completely engulfing her. Within minutes, she sank to the bottom of the harbor. More than 1,100 men went down with the Arizona. At 8.05, after two torpedo hits, the target ship Utah strained against her mooring lines with a 30-degree list. With her torpedo blister removed, the Utah had little chance of surviving the attack. She capsized at 8.10. In the meantime, startled citizens of Honolulu looked upward, wondering what was causing the noise and smoke. Many needed some time to realize that this was not just another drill. Soon, American anti-aircraft shells began tumbling into downtown Honolulu. The explosion and resulting fires caused a number of civilian casualties. When it sticks in my mind, we heard the Arizona, when the explosion on the Arizona. And of course, uh, we had to look behind us at the battleship because we were on the port side and our starboard side was facing where the battleships were at. And the planes came right down behind the Navy Yard and they were strafing everything, the torpedo planes heading for the battleships. But um, the first we saw the explosion, naturally we, you would look around and uh, it just, it looked like the whole, uh, the whole row of battleships blew up. And, uh, but it was the Arizona, and then the Oklahoma was rolling over just about the same time. It was turning all completely over. And our gun captain was a bosun's mate second, and he'd been in the Navy 16 years, and they, uh, those guys, uh, they just couldn't believe it. Because uh, I remember him, he had tears streaming down his face and saying, wait till our planes get in the air. But, Unfortunately, they didn't ever get in the air because they had that attack synchronized where they knocked out all the airfields and they had all these planes bunched up together on the runway trying to uh, keep them from being sabotaged. And uh, they were just sitting ducks for these Jap fighters come down through there strafing them. We were a repair ship and we had various ships come alongside and spend a few days alongside of us. On the morning of the attack, I was we were tied up to the USS Arizona. I'm one deck down in the shop reading the, the Honolulu Gazette, and the right-hand column is talking about the negotiations going on in Washington between Admiral Caruso, or Caruso and Nomoro, and uh, our Secretary of State, Cordell Hall. Bear in mind, I'm very, very concerned. I'm thinking about these things. It's on the right-hand column, right-hand side, if you get the Honolulu Gazette, December the 7th, 1941, that's where you'll find it, in the right-hand column. As I was reading this column, the boatswain mate passed the word, all hands to quarters. Now, we don't usually have quarters on Sunday morning, never did. I ran to my quarter station, and the reason I ran, because of the urgency in his voice, told me that something was up. As I ran to my quarter station, I went up the ladder and went around the fan tail of the ship, next to a 3 inch 50 caliber anti-aircraft gun, tracer shells skipped off the deck both to my left and to my right. Now bear in mind, between tracer shells, there has to be a row of shells you don't see. So when a tracer shell skipped across the deck on both sides of me, I heard something go I glanced up, saw the plane peel off, the red ball on the right wing. I then knew the boatswain mate had passed the wrong word. He meant general quarters not quarters where you fall in and receive the order of the day. So my general quarter station, I had to duck and dodge. I was on the top side next to the Arizona to get to the first hatch and go down in there where I was in the damage control party. 
as I went down the ladder, as I stepped from the, the left of the ladder to the right of the ladder, a bomb came down the ladder, came through the, the hatch, tore the ladder off the top, top of the hatch, and went on down through the ship and exploded in the bottom, blew a hole out the bottom. Now, I found out later, we were told, that that was a 16-inch armor-piercing armor, armor, uh, armor piercing shell that the Japs were using because we were tied up to the battleships and battleship row, and they had to use that type of weaponry in order to penetrate the thick decks on the battleships. So whether ours was an accident or on purpose, I don't know, but anyway, it went through our ship from top to bottom, see. That was an armor-piercing shell. So that was, I measured it off later, and I took three steps from where I was to, to the hole in the, in the deck where I was standing just seconds before. So that was my second close call of, the, of that morning. The, the other bomb hit up forward in the supplier area where the steel was stored and stuff like that. It didn't penetrate the bottom of the ship. However, when the Arizona, we were on fire on our starboard side, and when the Arizona blew up, it put the fires out on our starboard side. So what killed fellows over there saved fellows on our ship. See. At about 8.30 a.m., the first wave of Japanese planes, their ordnance expended, broke off the attack and headed back out to sea. Within minutes, a second strike as strong as the first came over. Hampered by dense smoke from the damage inflicted by the first strike and by the increasingly voluminous anti-aircraft fire, as well as surviving American P-40s, the second strike inflicted relatively little damage. second wave, the crew of the Nevada, despite the damage done to her, got her underway and moved her down the channel toward the open sea. Before she could clear the harbor, the second wave arrived, 170 more bombers and fighters. Seeing the Nevada under steam, they concentrated their initial attacks on her, hoping to sink her in the middle of the channel and block it. On orders from harbor control, the Nevada beached herself at Hospital Point. Then, as suddenly as they had come, the attackers vanished. In a little more than an hour and 45 minutes, the Japanese had smashed the pride of the Pacific Fleet and changed naval dictum forever. I saw a, a devastating sight. Decapitated bodies from the gun turrets, arms and legs strewn over the deck, blood running out of scuppers. Men walking down the deck, completely burned with their clothes burned off and their skin hanging down. You heard the old term, dead men walking. Some of them fell over the side. We couldn't get to them. They fell over the side. It was burned into, into shreds almost. It was a tragic sight to see. Of the approximately 100 U.S. Navy ships present in the harbor that day, all eight battleships were damaged, five were sunk. Eleven smaller ships, including cruisers and destroyers, were also badly damaged. The wounded included 1,178 people. Among those killed were 2,335 servicemen and 68 civilians. The USS Arizona was dealt the worst blow of the attack. A 1,760-pound bomb struck it, exploding the ammunition on board and killing 1,177 servicemen. Even as the second strike flew back to the carriers, a critical argument was going on aboard the Japanese flagship. Impressed by the success of the first strike, 
air-minded officers were trying to convince Nagumo to undertake a third strike, this time against the harbor installations, warehouse, and fuel dumps. Nagumo demurred, concerned over the location of the missing American carriers, which had not yet been located. As a result, as soon as the second strike had been recovered, their strike force turned back to Japan. No Japanese naval task force would ever again penetrate so far eastward. Pearl Harbor was a devastating defeat for the United States. A total of 18 warships were sunk or damaged, including two battleships that were total losses, Arizona and Oklahoma. In addition, nearly 200 aircraft were destroyed. Japanese losses were five midget submarines, and about 28 aircraft for a total of less than 50 men. Arguably, the defeat could have been worse. The three Pacific Fleet carriers escaped the debacle. Saratoga was undergoing a refit at San Diego, while Lexington and Enterprise were at sea, returning from delivering additional aircraft to Wake Island. A case can be made that Nagumo's decision not to undertake a third strike was an error, for it would have destroyed the fuel dumps, thereby crippling the remnants of the fleet, and so seriously damaged the harbor facilities and forced the U.S. fleet back to the West Coast. But it is important to note that Nagumo's second strike had been relatively ineffective and suffered the greatest losses. A third attack may have meant losing the advantage of surprise, valuable airmen, and as long as the U.S. carriers remained undetected, even losing the fleet itself. Sunset did not end the commotion in the skies over Oahu. At 1010, six Wildcats from the U.S. carrier Enterprise returning from delivering aircraft to Wake Island droned over the harbor. Below them, the sight was one of hell on earth. The Arizona continued to burn, as she would until the ninth. Also aflame was the destroyer Shaw, the battleship California, and many of the military installations and airfields around the island. Just as the six pilots lowered their gear and entered the landing pattern for Fort Island, the harbor defenders opened up with everything they had. Miraculously, two of the planes landed safely, and a third made nearby Barber Point. However, three of the Navy aviators were killed by friendly fire. The last fallen warriors of a long day of death. Back on the West Virginia, sitting on the bottom, water on her decks, then air spaces below sitting on the bottom. After the West Virginia settled, you could hear banging, kang, kang, kang. Men with wrenches or hammers beating on the metal, trying to let people know they were trapped there. But they were below a section which was full of water, and they were down, way down. If you've ever seen a battleship up close, especially when they're in dry dock. You can't believe how big they are below the waterline. Why, there's several, it must be six, eight, ten stories below there. They have a band of armor, armor all around both sides, 18 inches thick. The Japanese torpedoes cracked that open like it was eggshells. And the penetrated armor plate on the decks and exploded. These brave samurais, warriors, came like thieves in the night without a declaration of war. They slaughtered my comrades. I never forgave them for what they did. I don't think I ever will.
As the pilots who carried out the second wave of the attack on Pearl Harbor returned to their carriers, jubilant at the damage they had done and confident in their victory, their commanding officers were engaged in heated discussions over what to do next. From his flagship, the Hiryu, Rear Admiral Taman Yamaguchi, commander of the 2nd Carrier Division, sent a message to Admiral Chuichi Nagumo, commander of the Pearl Harbor Striking Force, that he was ready to launch another attack. The pilots gathered on the flight decks of their carriers and waited for the command to attack again. Admiral Nagumo was questioning Lieutenant Commander Mitsuno Fuchida, who had been chosen by Admiral Yamamoto to lead the airstrike. Yes, Commander Fuchida reported, he believed the battleship force of the U.S. Pacific Fleet was completely immobilized for six months. No, he admitted, the American carriers were not at Pearl, as the Japanese high command had hoped. The three carrier task groups were at sea, possibly nearby. Admiral Nagumo had never liked the Pearl Harbor attack plan, and now with the seas beneath his ships getting choppy and his heart heavy with the fear that one of the American carrier groups might stumble upon them if they stayed long enough to launch a third attack, he ordered his carriers to stow their plane and come about for the return trip to Japan. Nagumo and his chief of staff, Rear Admiral Ryunosake Kusaka, who also had been opposed to the surprise attack, believed that they had accomplished their mission. They had, they believed, prevented the United States from waging war in the Pacific for at least six months and assured the safety of the attack forces on their way to attack Malaya and the Philippines. Best of all, they had done this without risking their own carriers. But by not staying to exploit their victory, a mistake which puzzled even the American command, Nagumo and Kusaka left the Americans in better shape than they realized, and their superiors in the Japanese military establishment knew it even before the attack force returned home in apparent triumph. Fortunately for Japan, her naval and air forces were on the move elsewhere in the Pacific. The attack at Pearl Harbor was just the opening salvo in what was a well-planned and devastating three-pronged attack. For the next 72 hours, the Japanese would unleash their military forces all across the Pacific. On the night of December 7th, Japanese troops landed at Singora in British Malaya, losing only nine men. Early on December 8th, Japanese planes and warships attacked Davao and Guam. Bombers from the Kwajalein Atoll base in the Marshall Islands, given to Japan by the League of Nations, bombed Wake Island. also bombed Singapore and the nearby naval base. Vice Admiral Minichi Koga surrounded the island of Hong Kong with his ships while planes from Japanese bases in South China bombed it repeatedly. Before overrunning Shanghai, Japanese naval forces sank the HMS Petrel after the crew of the British gunboat refused to surrender, then boarded the USS Wake and imprisoned her crew. The 
Japanese army in Indochina crossed the border into Thailand and took over the country without a fight by diplomatic accommodation. While the bombs rained down on Hawaii, Navy pilots of Japan's 11th Imperial Air Fleet, based on Formosa, spent a fitful night beside their planes waiting for a heavy fog to lift. Their assignment? To bomb the critically important American airfields 500 miles away in the Philippines, part of the coordinated attack on U.S. forces stretching across the Pacific from Pearl to Wake Island, Guam, and Manila. At 6 a.m., tension on Formosa was growing thicker than the fog. A loudspeaker blared the news of the attack on Pearl Harbor, sending the Japanese forces into resounding cheers. Now their mission had acquired an added risk. The Americans would no longer be surprised and surely be waiting in strength. The fog lifted, and by 10.45, December 8th, Philippine time, 108 Japanese bombers and 84 Zero fighters were airborne and speeding toward Luzon, the largest island in the Philippines. While General Douglas MacArthur is, by most historians, considered one of the most capable military leaders the U.S. ever produced, an American Caesar, he had his failures. One of the most devastating was the manner in which he conducted the defense of the Philippines. There, Despite the fact that MacArthur had more than half a day's warning, the Americans were caught flat-footed. Immediately upon learning of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Major General Louis Brereton, commander of U.S. Air Forces in the Philippines, wanted permission to launch his bombers against the Japanese on Formosa. The Americans did not have adequate maps, and the B-17s would have to go without fighter protection but Brereton believed that his crews could inflict heavy damage on the Japanese bases. Brereton sent his planes aloft as a precaution and waited for a reply to his request. Hours passed with no reply from MacArthur. Then shortly after 10, the OK came. Brereton called his planes to land and refuel. It was then at about 12.20 p.m. while they were lined up in neat rows that the first bombs dropped. The damage was devastating. The Japanese surprised the majority of the U.S. Far East Air Force on the ground, destroying most of its B-17 bombers and P-40 fighters. Japan's program for conquest in the Pacific had begun with stunning effect. The United States naval and air power in both Hawaii and the Philippines had been dealt a series of terrible blows. On the same day, the vital outposts of Guam and Wake Island were bombed, and invasion was sure to follow. Guam's end was swift. In the hours after midnight on December 10th, some 5,400 Japanese Marines and infantry splashed ashore. By dawn, they had reached the governor's palace, where a brief firefight took place. As the sun came up, the Americans ceased fire, and the 427 U.S. Marines surrendered. On that ignominious note, the only piece of United States territory in the 3,000-mile stretch of the Western Pacific between Wake and the Philippines was lost. Wake was next. The first attack on Wake occurred just before noon on Pearl Harbor Day. Upon hearing of the attack on Pearl by radio, the island commander had his bugler sound called arms. The Marines grabbed their rifles and four Grumman Wildcats took off on patrol. Then a squall came up and the patrolling Wildcats missed a flight of 36 enemy planes that came in under the clouds. The Japanese strafed the airfield on Wake, blowing up seven of the fighters still on the ground. With the remaining planes, the flying Leathernecks managed to shoot down a dozen of the enemy bombers. Shortly after midnight on December 11th, Marine lookouts saw a blinking light on the horizon, and by dawn, a Japanese invasion force was waiting ashore. The Marines waited until the last minute to open fire. Their five-inch guns crippled the Kupari, 
flagship of the invasion force and sunk one destroyer. A second destroyer was hit and sunk by 100-pound bombs from the surviving Grummans. In a 45-minute battle, a few hundred Marines had beaten back an entire Japanese invasion fleet. The remaining Japanese forces turned tail and sailed back to their base at Kwajalein. The Americans had lost only one man. For the first time since the beginning of the war, the Japanese had been turned back. The attack on Wake was one of the most humiliating defeats of the Imperial Navy during the war. But the Japanese would be back in force. The Americans were not the only ones facing Japanese assaults. On December 10th, 84 bombers and torpedo planes dispatched from a Japanese airbase in Indochina with 1,000-pound bombs located the new British battleship Prince of Wales and her companion vessel, the battle cruiser Repulse, at sea north of Singapore and sank both in less than an hour. The British naval power in the east was broken. Though they had not delivered the finishing stroke at Pearl Harbor, the Japanese had put the Americans and the British on their heels in the Pacific. The Japanese Navy had been at war constantly since 1937, and it was in prime condition for war. The Americans and British would not be ready for months. When they were ready and set about the task of dislodging the Japanese from all the territories they had claimed in these 72 hours, they would find the going very rough indeed. For his part, Admiral Yamamoto knew within hours of the strike that it had failed to achieve its objective. It was just before 9 in the morning on December 8, Tokyo time, when he received word that Nagumo had stowed his planes and turned the carriers for home. In his diary, Yamamoto wrote that he had been prepared to lose two of his aircraft carriers to achieve total victory at Hawaii. The American carriers Yamamoto knew were the real prizes, and Nagumo had not bagged them. Yamamoto knew that modern warfare already had made battleships obsolete, and that the three American carrier groups still at large in the Pacific posed a much greater threat than Japan would have had to fear from the great ships now lying in the mud or aflame in Pearl Harbor. Yamamoto, a poet and fanatical bridge player, summarized his feelings with a bit of dark humor in a waka, a classical Japanese poem of five lines. What I have achieved is far from a grand slam. Let me in all modesty declare it is more like a redoubled bid just made. Adolf Hitler received the news of the bombing of Pearl Harbor in his remote underground bunker, the Wolf's Lair, some 450 miles northeast of Berlin. When press officer Heinz Lorenz handed him a cable containing the news, the Fuhrer slapped his thigh and shouted, The Turning Point! Hitler could hardly contain his ebullience when he related the news to Generals Alfred Jodl and Wilhelm Keitel. Now it is impossible for Germany to lose the war. We now have an ally who has never been vanquished in 3,000 years. Roosevelt must be smashed. It has been the major accomplishment of the Japanese that they have destroyed the myth of American superiority from the start. But Yodel and Kaito, like the other generals in his command, had misgivings about the news from Hawaii. They all had hoped that Japan would enter the war but in Siberia and against the Russians to take some pressure off the Wehrmacht on Germany's eastern front. Though General Heinz Guderian's 63rd Corps was entrenched in the suburbs of Moscow, it, like most of Army Group Center, was all but immobilized by the snow and cold. Most of the air support with which the German armies had started the Russian campaign had been transferred to North Africa, where British forces were doing a good job of keeping much-needed supplies from getting through to Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps. 
In the first hours after Pearl Harbor, Guderian began to move his troops back from Moscow, suffering heavy losses as he went. If he knew any of this, the Fuhrer chose to put it out of his mind, celebrating the Japanese victory even his closest generals believed would avail the Reich very little. They were more concerned with the Russian winter than with Japanese military action in the Pacific. Japan's action, all the generals agreed, promised no help to the armies on the Eastern Front. For them, rather, it evoked the specter of America's entry into the war on the side of an enemy who already was gaining the upper hand. On December 8th, before leaving for Berlin and a ceremony honoring Japan's ambassador Oshima for his country's success, Hitler sent word to Admiral Dönitz of the Kriegsmarine to have his U-boats begin attacking American ships wherever they found them. German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop knew that Hitler was preparing to declare war on the United States. Just minutes before an afternoon appointment with the Japanese ambassador, during which he knew Oshima would press for that declaration under the terms of the Axis Pact, Ribbentrop reminded the Fuhrer that Germany was not obliged to do so. Because Japan had attacked the United States, Germany was not bound by the accord to enter the war between the two nations. Hitler would hear none of it. If we do not stand on the side of Japan, he told his minister, the pact is politically dead. And that was not Hitler's main reason for wanting war with the US. It had, he told Ribbentrop, already been a significant force in the war. What's more, Hitler knew, America's leaders believed it could not be ready to fight a major war until at least 1943. The time to strike was now. On December 11th, Hitler addressed the Reichstag, calling Roosevelt a criminal backed by millionaires and Jews who had provoked Japan into attacking the United States. Before Hitler could even say the words he had summoned them to hear, the members of the Reichstag rose and cheered him wildly. Back in the Wolfslayer, the generals were astonished at the swift declaration. They knew that the Reich could not possibly widen the scope of its military commitment with any hope of success. Hermann Göring, commander of the Luftwaffe, was more direct. Privately, he called Hitler's headlong rush to war with the U.S. Selbstmord, suicide. As Japan's naval air forces were descending upon Pearl Harbor, about to deal the blow that would shake the United States forever from her isolationist mentality, the government of the United States was, with some exceptions, at lunch. Eleanor Roosevelt, wife of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was entertaining several dozen lunch guests in the Blue Room. The president would not be able to attend, she told her guests, because the news from Japan was very bad. The timing of the First Lady's comment was coincidental. She meant only that negotiations between the two nations were keeping the President too busy for socializing. No one in Washington had yet heard about the awful events in Hawaii. It was 1.30 p.m. when news of the attack first began to reach Washington. In a hallway near the office of Navy Secretary Frank Knox, an aide found Secretary Knox on his way to lunch and handed him an eight-word message from Ford Island, Hawaii. Air Raid Pearl Harbor, this is no drill. Knox's first reaction was disbelief. This must be the Philippines. Another aide assured the secretary it was not. It took Secretary Knox more than a quarter of an hour to reach President Roosevelt with the news. Mr. President, Knox said, it looks as if the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt's first reaction was similar to Knox's. No, was all he said before Knox hung up. To staff in his office, Roosevelt said, it was just the kind of unexpected thing the Japanese would do. 
At the time they were discussing peace in the Pacific, they were plotting to overthrow it. If this report is true, it would take matters entirely out of my hands. Then he picked up the phone. Just after 2 p.m. DC time, 8.30 a.m. Pearl time, the president called Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson to tell him they have attacked Hawaii. They are now bombing Hawaii. At 2.05 p.m., Roosevelt reached Secretary of State Cordell Howell at his office. Japan's ambassador, Kichi Saburo Nomura, and special envoy Saburo Kurusu had just arrived at Hull's office more than an hour late for a 1 p.m. appointment with Hull. Roosevelt told Hull about the attack on Pearl Harbor and instructed him to say nothing of it to the two Japanese diplomats. Hull was to receive the two formally and coolly, hear what they had to say and bow them out. On instructions from his government, Ambassador Nomura had called only that morning to make the appointment. Tokyo had sent him what amounted to a 14-part ultimatum to the United States government on its policy toward Japan and ordered him to deliver it at precisely 1 p.m. Washington time, which was 7.30 a.m. in Hawaii. As it happened, it had taken much longer for the document to be prepared than either Tokyo or the Japanese embassy in Washington could have anticipated. By the time Nomura arrived at the State Department with the message in hand, the first wave was over and official Washington already had heard the news. What's more, the U.S. State Department already had intercepted, decrypted, and read the contents of the message as they were being sent to Nomura. Secretary Hall's anger had been building for some time when he received the Japanese diplomats. He pretended to read the document they handed him and then asked Nomura, why one o'clock? Hull knew, of course, what Nomura did not, that the original appointment time was half an hour after the bombing had begun. Nomura said, I don't know the reason, but I was so instructed. Still pretending to read the document, Hull began shouting at the two Japanese. The message, he told them, was crowded with infamous falsehoods and distortions on a scale so huge that I never imagined until today that any government on this planet was capable of uttering them. Then he ordered them out of his office. It took very little time for news of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor to reach the American public. At 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, the mutual broadcasting system was announcing the news to its radio listeners. One of them angrily called the network switchboard in New York. He had heard and believed Mutual's 1938 broadcast of Orson Welles' War of the Worlds and wanted the network to know he wasn't about to be taken in a second time. At 2.31 p.m., CBS announcer John Daly interrupted regular programming with word of the bombing. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, the president has just announced. The attack was also made on naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. At Radio City Music Hall, crowds of moviegoers who had come to see Cary Grant and Joan Fontaine in suspicion got the news from the ticker tape machine in the lobby. Some rushed home immediately. Others went on into the hall to watch the film. In Holyoke, Massachusetts, Major Curtis LeMay had just finished a day of training new members of his 34th bomb group on their two B-17 flying fortresses when he turned on the radio in his car to listen to the Giants game. Hearing the war bulletins, LeMay said he felt relief that the waiting was over. Charles Lindbergh heard the news of the Pearl Harbor bombing at his retreat on Martha's Vineyard. Lindbergh, a leading voice for American isolationism and a strident opponent of President Roosevelt's lend-lease arrangement to help Great Britain fight the Nazis, could not believe that Japan was capable of such a victory. His first thought, was that the only possible reason for the success of the Japanese attack was that Roosevelt had sent so much of the U.S. Navy to the Atlantic. The president had left Hawaii defenseless in order to help Churchill, and the devastation at Pearl Harbor would surely convince America to stay out of the war. Just as the Japanese had done, Lindbergh badly misjudged the reaction of the American people. On the West Coast, Tensions ran high as the residents braced for a possible Japanese invasion. 
they began to regard their Japanese-American and Nisei neighbors suspiciously. In San Pedro, California, and nearby Long Beach, the tuna fleet, which was mostly Japanese-Americans, had set out to sea in the morning, then abruptly turned back to port when they heard radio reports of the Pearl Harbor bombing. By 9 o'clock on the evening of December 7th, many of them were in the detention pen at Terminal Island, where more than 300 Japanese had been imprisoned after being taken from their homes and cars and boats. The next day, December 8th, at just after 12.30 in the afternoon Eastern Time, Sam Rayburn, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, introduced President Roosevelt to a rare joint session of the House and the Senate. Wearing heavy metal leg braces, the President stood before the group of 339 congressmen and 82 senators and asked them to declare war on Japan. The people of the United States have already form their opinions and well understand the implications to the very life and safety of our nation. As Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, I have directed that all measures be taken for our defense, but always will our whole nation remember the character of the onslaught against us. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. After Roosevelt's speech, the Senate voted unanimously for war. In the House, only one person, Representative Jeanette Rankin, voted no. Afterwards, she said she did it because she did not want the world to think America was war crazy. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 